Tiong, they take down the Lakers tonight, 127-117. I got the expert, Jack Borman. He's going to help us break it all down. It's all coming up next on the Lockdown Wolves Postcast. You are Locked On Wolves Postcast, part of Locked On Minnesota on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for staying up late again. We're back in the lap, back at it. Another T-Wolves postcast episode right here on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota Network. You got myself, Luke Inman, at Luke underscore Spinman. That's the man, Jack Borman. He's on X, at JR Borman 13. And Jack, before we jump into all the action, quick reminder, tonight's episode brought to us by FanDuel, America's number one sports book and official sports book partner of the NBA. All right, man. Wolves coming off that. It was a brutal loss in Phoenix Friday night. They stay on the West Coast. They get the Lakers tonight. Arguably, by the way, the hottest team in the league right now. Nine and one in their last 10. However, no LeBron tonight. Some flu-like symptoms. And first quarter, Anthony Davis just gets whacked in the face, man. On a little putback under the rim. He did not return. More on that a little bit later. Wolves, though. Jekyll and Hyde, that's what they pulled tonight. It was a Jekyll and Hyde. Everything they struggled with Friday versus the Suns felt like it disappeared. It all dissipated Friday. Remember, they had the lowest first quarter total they had all season with 16 tonight. What do they do? They put up 46 in the second quarter alone. New record for most points in the quarter all season. Friday, they scored 87 points total. Tonight, they had 79 in the first half alone. So huge night from Nas Reed. I know we'll get into that here in a second, 31 points. Lakers, they battled back a little bit in the third. They got it back to single digits, but too little, too late. Wolves hold on, finish this West Coast road trip with, it was a huge confidence booster, man. That's that's how I imagine they're feeling right now, getting on the plane, flying back to Minneapolis. They stay tied with Denver for that one seed, which means they own the one seed because of the head-to-head tiebreaker. And they get to go back home now on Tuesday, they take home those lowly Wizards. So kick us off, man. Uh, what a difference one game can make. Just give us your biggest takeaways after what we just saw. Yeah, like you touched on, right? A big game for Nas Reed, his first ever 30-point, 10-rebound game, which was which was awesome. And and he, you know, now for the second straight time, playing at, at Crypto.com Arena, you know, since they changed the name, it's, it's, been, the, it's been the house that Nas Reed built, man. Um <laughs> Yeah, but but the Timberwolves offense was was tremendous in this game. They played with great pace. They got off the ball early. They were spreading it around and, and outside of some, you know, some early sloppiness and and some careless possessions there in the in the third quarter, they did a great job of, of sharing the ball. They had 29 assists. They improved, I believe, to 24 and 3, or excuse me, 25 and 3. Uh, when they have at least 29 assists, which is a which is a great number for this offense. But it but it really was all centered around Anthony Edwards and, and Nas Reed. Uh, you know, Nas had, like I said, 31, 11, three stocks, only one turnover. Um, and again, he had 25 points and, and five, three pointers in the last matchup. And for him to, to tonight, follow that up with 31 points and, and six made threes, uh, makes a ton of sense against a, a Lakers defense that wants to play deep drop coverage. And they also pack the paint and they play in the gap. So what can you do? You can shoot over the top of that defense if they're going to sag off shooters. And that's exactly what happened because they want to, you know, funnel everything to Anthony Davis at the rim. And, um, you know, if you can just continue to continually bomb threes over the top of that defense, good things are going to be able to happen if you're able to knock them down. And then uh, for now, I think he had 23 in the first half. I believe that's the highest scoring first half or any half of, of Nas Reed's career, which was awesome. And then Anthony Edwards, 26 points, eight assists, one turnover. It was an awesome playmaking night for, for Ant. He really let the game come to him. He didn't force anything at all. I can't think of one possession where he really forced the issue with, on a shot or, you know, you know, kind of telegraphing a read and, and really kind of tunnel it, tunnel vision, tunnel visioning mm -hmm. on right. a pass or a shot. And, and that's always a, a great barometer for, for Ant. If he can just kind of, read what the defense is doing and, and make the best decision almost every single time you're going to take that for, from Ant and, and for Ant and I specifically, those two guys did not play well at all uh, on Friday night in Phoenix and for them to turn around tonight and play the way they did. I mean, they had 25 points on nine of 32 shooting. It's 28% made three of their 11 threes, 27%. And they had five assists and nine turnovers in that game. 
and, and those two were the, the primary culprits for just about everything that was bad about the Wolves offense on Friday night. And then tonight, 57 points on, on 58% shooting, and they made nine of their 16 threes for uh, 56%. They had nine assists and just two turnovers, I believe. So mm. a really good bounce back night from the, or excuse me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Nine assists and, and two turnovers. So a really good bounce back night from them. And then Rudy Gobert was awesome, man. He was, he was everywhere on the offensive glass. Eight of his 16 rebounds were offensive rebounds. He had four putbacks, which was, which was tremendous. And then just did a really good job kind of settling things down and, and kind of calling for, for certain, uh, you know, pin down plays to try to get Mike Conley back in the game a little bit. And then uh, some other handoff actions with Jordan McLaughlin, which was great and, and set some great screens to get Monte Morris free in the, in the paint. And then Monte did a great job of just kind of spraying the ball around and getting some good ball movement going there with the second unit. Uh, and then Nikhil Alexander Walker had 15 points, some, some really big uh, momentum killing shots had that huge three at the end of the first half, which was, which was really important to kind of help get the wolves some breathing room going into the break. And then Jade McDaniels uh, scored in double figures for the first time since that win at Denver uh, a little more than a week ago. So five games ago, good to see him kind of get some rhythm, had a couple of great takes against Austin Reeves. I thought this is a game where he might kind of get his footing back a little bit that LA would probably put smaller guys on him with them starting three guards tonight. Uh, and the, really the only downside about the Timberwolves offense, you can nitpick and say that the 16 turnovers wasn't great, but uh, it was it was Mike Conley, I, I think, for, for me. You know, only seven points on, on two of eight shooting, only made one of his five three-pointers. And, and and this was his third game in a row where he had at least three turnovers. That's the, that's the first time that this has happened all season. And it's also the most uh, turnovers he's had in a three-game span all season. And so Mike has struggled a little bit the last three games. It's going to be really important for him to – be able to kind of finish the rest of the regular season strong and, and get into the playoffs. But I guess the good news is that you've got Monte Morris, you've got Jordan McLaughlin, you've got Kyle Anderson, some guys who have been playing pretty good basketball uh, for, for the last month and change. And so if Mike is struggling, it would not surprise me at all to see that uh, Mike Conley would sit on Tuesday on the front end of a back-to-back. -back. He did not play in, in the Wolves' most recent back-to-back, -back, the second night of it. And, and obviously yep. the second night of this back-to-back -back is in Denver. So you want to he's ready to go for uh, for that game. But, you know, you really can't complain. Timberwolves scored 127 points, shot 52% from the floor, shot 39% from three, and made 12 of their 14 free throws. Um, so it was just a great night for the Timberwolves offense and, and fun to see them get a win with, with offense and not necessarily needing to just ride that defense to the finish line. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you already touched on it. I don't want to get too redundant here, but Nas Reed is like the A topic, man. Statement game, big boy numbers, first 30 and 10 I believe you mentioned uh of his career which is unbelievable to do that again like you said in LA where he's had success that's just fun what a huge bounce back game though after Friday man I'm not going to pull up the numbers but it was one of his worst shooting nights he had all year how huge is it I guess for not just his confidence but his teammates confidence as well knowing full well okay he's got to be that number two behind Ant for however long Cats outright uh, I mean what was cooking for him so well tonight with Ant and the entire offense, really? Like, what tangibly – I know you mentioned, uh, you know, how great the pace was early on and things like that. How much did that have to do with things, I guess? And what do they have to do to keep that moving forward with them into these last four games? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny because we, we talk all the time about Nas Reed being the best fit in this system and that he's the best at making really quick decisions with the ball in his hand, just kind of mm -hmm. whether it's a good decision or a bad decision, just making a decision quickly. And, and he's great at that. But he's also probably the biggest beneficiary of when his teammates do the same thing. Because when the, when the defense is moving around, Nas is so good at pump faking and going or, you know, faking a pass and then putting the ball in the deck. And, and tonight he just made the right decision almost every single time in terms of, should I pass the ball? Should I shoot a three? Should I put it on the deck and drive into the paint? And, you know, it's very similarly to Carl Anthony Towns, when, when those two guys are making the right decision in that kind of triple threat scenario, almost every single time they're going to put up huge scoring numbers. They're going to be really efficient and the Timberwolves offense is going to be really difficult to stop. And so Nas can certainly be a Carl Anthony Towns facsimile in that regard. And tonight we just saw it to the nth degree, right? And that, Nas was really confident when he makes his first three of the game. I, you know, I would love to do a, a statistical deep dive of when Nas Reed makes his first shot of the game, what his stats are for the rest of the game relative to when he misses his first yeah, no shot. Because sure he was did. he was just in a rhythm from the very first moment he touched the ball and 
And you have to think that that last game against the Lakers was in the back of his mind in that, you know, he played super well in that arena, probably walked in with the same amount of confidence and, and certainly probably felt even more confidence without Anthony Davis waiting for him at the rim in the, the final three quarters. But but for his shot mix to be what it was, you know, eight eight shots from three, eight shots inside the arc, you know, he, he normally would see Naz uh, get to the free throw line more than just three times. But for him to score 31 points with just one free throw made it is pretty impressive for him. So just a, a great job of, of taking smart shots again when the defense was moving, made the right decisions of when to drive, when to shoot, and, and it all paid off for him. And you mentioned Mike Conley as well. Again, kind of an off night. What, three turnovers again? Struggle with these turnovers in three straight games, as you mentioned. Just a funk right now? Like, one to ten. How concerned knowing, okay, we only got four games before the playoffs and not necessarily the momentum you want heading into the playoffs when it matters most when you know you're going to lean on your crafty veteran in those critical crunch time games. Yeah, I think you just got to trust him, right? Because he's been doing it for so long yeah. and that, you know, he kind of knows how to scale up his game and and, and all that. I, I certainly think that he, he's been a guy that has missed Carl Anthony Towns and in, in that, you know, Carl's normally a guy that they can go to at the start of the second quarter, the start of the fourth quarter for for scoring. And, and now more of the onus has kind of been shifted onto him in terms of having to ramp some of that up. And I think that took a toll on him a little bit. He also had his ankle was a little banged up that Chris Finch said last week. So that's just kind of something to keep an eye on. Um, I don't think it's hampering him all that much. I think he's okay. just kind of, you know, getting into the paint and and making some poor passes in, in terms of some of the decision-making and how ambitious he's trying to get with some of these passes when he's in a crowd. But, you know, again, it's it's about the body of work. He was, he was phenomenal for the Wolves down the stretch last season in big-time games, and, and you hope that, that he'll be able to turn it around because right before that uh, – right before that Phoenix game, he'd been shooting the ball lights out from three. So you'd hope that that'd be able to turn around. Yeah, well said. Again, with a guy like that, not too worried. Again, only reason I even bring it up, just because we're so close to the playoffs. But a lot of good points, good breakdown there. All right, plenty more deep dive on the Wolves tonight and where they stack up in the West. That's all coming up right after this. Quick reminder, tonight's episode brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience. What brings home the winning trophy is what also keeps your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors, they got everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to the ultimate peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, eBay Motors, they got it all. And whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. Check this out. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay's guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. All right, just back to the Friday's game in Phoenix. Everything felt wrong about that one, but you and I did talk about the lone bright spot in certain areas, not everything, but certain areas, was the defense. The defense always seems to be that crutch for them, no matter how bad things are looking. Give us the quick takeaways on that end of the floor tonight. Where did they really shine, I guess, tonight? And, and what impressed you the most? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's it's the way that Anthony Edwards and Jade McDaniels played defense on Austin Reeves and, and D'Angelo Russell, right? Anthony Edwards was terrible defensively in the first few minutes of this game. Let D'Angelo Russell do whatever he wanted to. And, and then... Uh, let Austin Reeves cook him off the bounce and got him in the air for that foul. Mm -hmm. and, and he really locked mm -hmm. in for the most part after that, especially on the ball. I mean, those two guys had 29 points on nine of 33 shooting. That's just 27%. And, and those were going to be the two main perimeter guys without LeBron James in this game. And so being able to do that and force really tough shots for those guys for the majority of the game was great. And between the two of them, they only made three three-pointers. And I, I know that you know, those two guys, the, the the probably the best parts of their game are what they're able to do below the arc. And and for those guys to also, you know, be able to contest shots in the perimeter and, and make it difficult for those guys, I think was awesome. And they forced them into spots for the majority of the game that they don't want to go. And, and that, you know, D'Angelo Russell had to play into a lot of length in the middle of the floor. And, and Austin Reeves is forced to go to the baseline quite a bit in this game. And then, 
you know, obviously Anthony Davis being out was a, was a huge bummer for the Lakers because it, it the trends were not great in that first quarter. But, but you have to credit the Wolves for for their ability to kind of clamp down after the first quarter. The first quarter, the Timberwolves allowed Lakers to shoot seven of nine at the rim in the first quarter, so seven makes in that one quarter. They only had nine makes at the rim the rest of the game. And so that that's obviously great. And Rudy Gobert did a great job of forcing, as we've said all year on this show, uh, Lakers to take a lot more short mid-range shots. They were 11 of 31. That's 35%, and the, and the league average is right around 43%. So, again, that's a great job forcing the Lakers to take tough, you know, analytically bad shots. And Timberwolves forced 15 turnovers, and, and 12 of them were live ball turnovers that allowed them to get going the other way. They had 12 points uh, on the break, which is great. And, again, 80% uh, live ball turnover rate is, is awesome. Anything above 60% is elite. So, so to do 80% is great. And then the, the Timberwolves really did a great job of rebounding in the, in the second half, especially the, the Lakers had six offensive rebounds for seven second chance points in the first quarter. Then they only had four offensive rebounds for four second chance points in the final three quarters. Again, Anthony Davis not being there was a, was a huge issue there. But, but the one, the one thing, if you do have to nitpick is the Wolves really struggled to defend without fouling, uh, yeah, especially when, yeah. when they got going inside on the drive. They had, and, and the Lakers are really good at that already, no matter what though. Right. Yep, like that's third, kind of their bread they're, they're third in the league in, in free throw attempts, fifth in the league in free throw rate. Um, again, they're a slower paced team, so that rate number, um, you know, is going to be a little bit lower. But, but yeah, I mean, the Lakers are a super physical team. They drive the ball as much as any team in the league. They post up as much as any team in the league, and they have really good off ball cutters. We saw that in the third quarter. Though they're you know late in the second quarter, and then in the third quarter, the Wolves just got carved up. Uh, by, by different cutters, and they've got a lot of really instinctual playmakers that can pull off some really difficult passes in, in LeBron James and D'Angelo Russell. So, And then the one other note defensively that I, I just want people to kind of file away in the back of their minds if the Wolves do end up playing the Timberwolves, or excuse me, if the Wolves do end up playing the Lakers in the first round of the playoffs, mm -hmm. Rui Hachimura had 30 points in this game, and he's, he's a certainly capable offensive player. He, he's a really solid mid-range shooter for the Lakers, and he, he really – picked on small guys a lot tonight and Darvin Ham really you know emphasized with his offensive yeah. group that they wanted to get the ball to Rui Hachimura inside when he had Nikhil Alexander Walker, Mike Conley, Monte Morris, someone like that that wasn't Kyle Anderson or Jane McDaniels mm -hmm. or Anthony yep. Edwards on him inside and that's that's something you got to keep in keep in mind because those are the types of games within the games that these coaches are trying to find and exploit over the course of a seven game series. And it would not surprise me whatsoever if, if the Timberwolves did draw this matchup in the first round that Hachimura would end up playing really well. And I think for the Wolves, then you've got to figure out, okay, you know, let's assume Carl Anthony Towns is going to be back and ready to go for game one of the playoffs. No, that's another big body that you're probably swapping out Jordan McLaughlin, some of his minutes some of Monte Morris's minutes for, for cat in a first round series. So it's going to be more about how can you make sure that the Lakers aren't able to to create that mismatch down in the post because he's he's pretty efficient down there. So that's something to that's something to keep in mind. But but again, if, if you told me tonight that Rui Hachimura was going to be the Lakers' leading scorer, you'd have to feel <laughs> right. pretty good about the Timberwolves' chances of, of winning the game, even without LeBron James and even without uh, Anthony Davis for three quarters. And I think you bring up a great point with Hachimura because there is a world, right, where you see this team again come playoff time. So even though we didn't see Braun and AD, is there anything else, kind of closing thoughts here before we move on to segment three, anything else we learned as far as the games within the games or matchup-wise that maybe we can take with us if we do see this Laker team again? Yeah, there, there's a couple things. There, the one thing that's been kind of reinforced throughout the season and was reinforced again tonight is the Lakers have nobody that can guard Anthony Edwards. True. That includes LeBron James. You know, when that LeBron wants to lock in and play defense, he's still a very good defender. He just doesn't do it all that often because he wants to conserve his energy for the offensive end. But but Anthony Edwards had a really easy 26 and 8 tonight. He he did not have to overexert himself. There's no one on the perimeter that can guard. Ant, you know, D'Lo, Austin Reeves, Dinwiddie, Hachimura, none of those guys are able to guard Ant. Uh, they, they'd probably have to play Jared Vanderbilt in order to guard Ant, and, and he's a guy that the Lakers did not play very much in the playoffs last season because of the way that he cratered spacing in some of the lineups. I know that Timberwolves fans are very familiar with that. And then another thing is, is who Jaden McDaniels guards. Jaden McDaniels has traditionally guarded LeBron James in those matchups, but I almost think that, you know, putting him on D'Angelo Russell and really shutting down D'Angelo Russell as a third option 
and forcing one of the other guys to step up is going to be really important. And it wouldn't surprise me one bit if we saw Anthony Edwards try to, you know, take the challenge of guarding LeBron James or see Carl Anthony Towns do it Mm -hmm. and really force LeBron to be a jump shooter. I know LeBron's shooting over 40% from three this year, but to force him to continually shoot that shot over and over and over in the playoffs, I think it would make sense to me to try to test that 40% and see if LeBron wants to just be a jump shooter instead of get downhill and, and make plays for his teammates. So that's another one to keep an eye on. And then the last one for me is, is who's going to guard Anthony Davis. And that, you know, it could be Rudy Gobert. It could be Carl Anthony Towns. It wouldn't surprise me one bit if the Wolves just junked up their defense. They played some zone, try to force the Lakers to get stagnant and just take a bunch of jumpers. And for me, I, I think you could almost do a similar thing in that you you play a little bit of that spy coverage where you have Carl Anthony Towns guard him and you have Anthony Davis cheat off of Jared Vanderbilt if Jared Vanderbilt were to start and, and play on uh, Anthony Edwards because that's something that you might see in a playoff series. I know that Vanderbilt still trying to recover from that midfoot sprain that he had. He might not be ready to go for, for game one of a playoff series. So so we'll see, but it'll be interesting because there's certainly going to be some cross-matching going on in, in a playoff series no matter how they you know end up coming out in terms of health and all that stuff. Uh, dude, it's going to be so fun coming on here with you and picking out whoever they play round one, just picking out all the matchups and the X's and O's and all the games within the game, man. Everything obviously amps up come playoff time, but man, it's going to be fun, especially for this Wolves team that we've had so much fun watching all season long. All right, don't go anywhere. One more segment left. We're going to preview the Wolves' final four games of the regular season. That's all coming up right after this. Quick reminder, tonight's episode brought to us by Amazon Fire TV, the number one streaming platform around from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis with Amazon Fire TV. They offer amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV. That gives you access to millions of movies and TV episodes, not to mention free and live cable TV as well. Whether it's the MLB season, you got PGA Masters right around the corner. I love the NFL draft. That's at the end of the month. Or March Madness Tourney Championship tomorrow night. Trust me when I say you're going to want to have a Fire TV at your fingertips on every device possible. Plus, Fire TV now includes all of our daily content from every Locked On channel and a vast majority of pro leagues and college conferences as well. You got to check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and your Alexa devices. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. That's Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. Hey, quick update on Cat. I know he was on the court putting up shots at shoot around. So I guess where's he at? If you know anything that, uh, you know, anybody else does in the rehab that you've heard, you know, where's as far as his schedule goes, where's he at in the process? Because we got to be getting close, right? Another two weeks, maybe at, at most. Is that the hope? Yeah, so his reevaluation date, uh, the Timberwolves said on March 12th, the date that he had surgery, that he would be reevaluated in four weeks. And that date is Tuesday. Okay. That is the that is the date Carl Anthony Towns has resumed some basketball activities. Obviously, we saw Alan Horton and Chris Hine uh, tweeted that that Carl Anthony Towns was getting some shots up at the end of practice today. And Anthony Edwards, in his uh, walk off interview with NBA TV tonight, did confirm that Carl Anthony Towns uh, will be back for the playoffs. Again, that's not really new news considering the the Shams report that. Uh, the Timberwolves were optimistic that Carl Anthony Towns would not just be back for the playoffs, but be back, uh, you know, with, with some time on the meter in the regular season. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, it's going to be a situation I think where, you know, do they want him to be a hundred percent and not really have much of a minutes restriction when he comes back? If, If he, you know, is, if it's just a conditioning thing and he can't injure the knee any further, you know, would you want to play Carl 15 minutes or 20 minutes, even if it means, you know, having to bring him off the bench or not being, right. you know, an exact kind of replica of what it's going to be like with him at full go back in the rotation. Um, so, so we'll see. Uh, those are all kind of questions that need to be answered, but, you know, I, you know, Ant saying that certainly is good news. And, you know, when you take a look at the Timberwolves schedule and you consider that they only have four games left here and, and the finale is one week from today, you know, you, you'd, you'd hope that, that Carl would be back some point this week, whether that's, 
you know, Wednesday against Denver is a, is a huge game in, on ESPN. We'll talk about it. Um, but then they've got two home games to close it out uh, on Friday and Sunday against Atlanta and Phoenix. And so you'd hope that you'd for sure have him back for at least one of those. Um, we'll end up see we'll end up seeing what happens. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up being kind of what it's been like for some of these other stars where Woj or Shams, um, you know, just drops it day of saying Carl's back tonight. Right. You know, That's we, what, Woj bomb. We'll yep. see. Yep. So no, you're right. Four games left now. All right. Back at home Tuesday, then monster game versus the Nuggets Wednesday on the back to back. Of course, it's got to be a back to back. When you look at these last four, though, oh, what's the things you think about the most regarding this team in crunch time right down at the wire? Because it's not really a secret. It really feels like this whole thing's just going to come down to the game on Wednesday night versus Denver, right? As far as the one seed goes, right? Got to beat Washington Tuesday, Nuggets Wednesday, back at home twice with Atlanta and Phoenix, who, as we all remember, just got mauled by. But if you win your next three, including obviously that means, yeah, you, you beat Denver. But if you win your next three, I think you have the one seed wrapped up going into your final game versus Phoenix. Correct me if I'm wrong, though. No correction needed. Uh, the Timberwolves would clinch the number one seed if they win their, ne their next three games. Uh, so the Timberwolves can go three and one uh, in order to clinch the, the number one seed in the playoffs. The only thing is that they do need to beat Denver. And if they beat Denver, they are, or if they lose to Denver, they're not going to have the number one seed because you go look at Denver's schedule. It's a bunch of tanking teams and then the Wolves and they'll beat all those tanking teams. So it's going to be that game for, for all the marbles. The Wolves obviously caught a huge break tonight that both LeBron and AD ended up being out, so they were able to kind of save that uh, one loss in the in the chamber, if you will, for, for that Phoenix game if they want to. You know, if they clinch the number one seed, they can completely punt on that game if they want to and just sit everybody. But, but you know, with, with Chris Finch as, as the coach, it, you know, probably aren't going to, aren't going to see that, but, but we'll see. I mean, the other, day, the other thing I would keep an eye on is that Hawks-Bulls, matchup I mean, the the 9 10 race in the east in that chicago is currently one game ahead of atlanta and atlanta has been above 500 since trey young got hurt because Dejounte mm. murray has been awesome um deandre hunter and, and clint capella have both been guys that have been um you know playing playing well for them uh pretty much for the majority of the season but then you get guys like bogdan bogdanovich getting rolling shooting the ball well from three and they can be a team that can be tough to contend with. And they've got a lot of players. Jalen Johnson, since he's come back from his injury, has been great. And that's a game that, that you cannot take lightly. I think you can take the, the Wizards game a little lightly, even though they've been pretty competitive. Um, they've been four and six in their last 10. They beat the Bucs, um, which was a bad, bad, bad loss for the Bucs. And uh, I think they beat the Heat as well. So, and, and Denny Avdia and, and Corey Kispert have been playing really, really well for them, both you know, averaging right around 20 points a game, 50% plus efficiency over the last 10 games. So again, you can't take those two Eastern conference opponents lightly, but you got to do everything in your power to make sure that you're hundred percent. You're mm -hmm. as not tired as you can be for that second night of a back-to-back -back in Denver on, on Wednesday night. That is a back-to-back, -back, not only for the Timberwolves, but yep. also for the Nuggets. So Huge. Front ends for both teams are against, you know, tanking teams that are pretty bad. So it'd be kind of interesting to see how each team manages the the load for for their stars and main rotation guys. I know Denver's been kind of having a ro rotating door of, you know, who's out, who's in with with trying to kind of rest some guys when they yeah. can down the stretch. So that that's going to be something to to keep an eye on as well. But, you know, Mike Malone is a guy that knows, or Michael Malone, excuse me, the, the Nuggets head coach is a guy that really knows how to motivate his guys and get his guys ready for big games and is the first guy to take responsibility when his teams are not ready to go. And he was, he was pretty frustrated after the Timberwolves, you know, really dominated that game in Denver a couple of weeks ago or, or last weekend, whatever it was. And, and so I think that that team's going to be jacked up and really ready to go. But but who knows? I mean, if, the, if, that, if that's the night that Carl Anthony Towns returns, you'd have to think that the Timberwolves are, are going to be feeling the exact same way. And the Timberwolves have almost been better on the road of late than they've been at home, just because I think that they lock in a little bit more, knowing yeah. that they they don't have that home court advantage. They've got to really focus in a lot more on the road. And I think, you know, you remove some of the distractions of being at home. 
right? I think, mm-hmm. especially for someone like Anthony Edwards, yep. he's a new dad, has a, has a newborn at home. I think sometimes when you're able to get out on the road, you're just able to, to you know, to, to focus on basketball. You don't have a, you know, a crazy newborn schedule of, of keeping up and, um, you know, and doing all that stuff. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but you've got to be encouraged with the way the Timberwolves have played the Nuggets, not only in that game, but for the majority of the season and, and really over the last couple of seasons when they've been at full strength has been pretty scary for, for the Nuggets. And so we'll see what ends up happening in terms of who's in, who's out for both teams. But, but yeah, it'll be a, be a really fun game considering what's at stake for, for both squads. Yeah, well said. Can't wait for that game. All right, we got 60 seconds left. Last one real quick. South Carolina takes down Caitlin Clark today. Gonzaga, Purdue tomorrow. Your reaction from today and your pick for tomorrow's night championship game. UConn, Purdue tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I, I, I thought today's game was, was a ton of fun. I, I think it was more just... You know, I think I think it was like 30 to nothing in bench points or 37 nothing in bench points for South Carolina, which is just an absurd number yeah. for them. I mean, the way that they got the contributions from Tessa Johnson's from Al- Albert Room, Al- Albertville, Minnesota. So really fun to see a Minnesota kid shine in a huge stage. Malaysia for Wiley was awesome off the bench. Those two were. were yeah, I think their the high scorer in- had, had like 19 points, which just speaks yeah. volumes when you got somebody like Caitlin Clark going for 31. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was really fun to see South Carolina get contributions up and down the board and, and Caitlin Clark putting up 18 in the first quarter. You couldn't have asked for a better start. She was pulling up from everywhere. It was a ton of fun, but, but Camilla Cardoso and, and Chloe Kitts and, and all the, you know, all the offensive rebounders that they have inside were just way too much for Iowa. And for them, I think to have something ridiculous, like 20 offensive rebounds in that game was, was kind of made it feel like it was inevitable, even in the first half when Iowa was leading and, and keeping up with them, it just felt like everything South Carolina was doing was, you know, was uh, you know, kind of more repeatable over the course of the game, more sustainable. And, and then for, for the, for the men's game, I, it's hard to pick against UConn. Right. They, they've absolutely steamrolled everybody. They've covered the spread, I believe, in, in every game in last year's tournament, every game in this year's tournament. They've won. They've covered every... the spread in every game in the and last two tournaments. I think it's they have. And, win. and I it's think a, they've won every game. Another thing to beat Vegas every single game, man. That's and I think they've won every game by double digits, too. Wow. They would and have to because the spread, I would assume, Vegas has got by eight, nine, ten, if not double digits. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, and it's the, wow. really going to be the first game all year that. Purdue is seeing somebody that has the size inside to match mm-hmm. Zach Eady. And then mm-hmm. Donovan Klingon is like seven, two and is at, you know, just as big as Zach Eady is. And Zach Eady is right. not just going to be able to turn around and, and flip the ball in the hoop. And, and Purdue's going to have to find other ways to score. And I just think that they're going to really struggle when, with Zach Eady, presumably not, you know, coasting the 28 and 14, like he has been in almost every single game, this, this tournament. So it'll be a fun matchup, but, but it's hard for me to not take UConn. I, I love, psychotic head coaches and and Dan Hurley is certainly <laughs> is a psycho on the sidelines. He's so yeah. yeah, especially with, with them having the, you know, kind of the experience and going through it last year and, and finding ways to win and, and knowing that they can win versus a team like Purdue that has really struggled in, yeah. in big games and big moments, not only this year, but in years past. It's, it's really hard for me to, to pick Purdue over you. Yeah, everybody wants parody, especially in March Madness. Everybody loves rooting for the Cinderella stories. But, man, hard not to go chalk, man. You're totally right. UConn's ability to be able to go on those 10 nothing runs just in the blink of an eye is just unbelievable. And I think you're right. I'm with you on that one. If I was a betting man, probably. Why buck the trend? I don't know what the spread is, man. That's going to be really interesting. But um, probably got to put your money on UConn once again. All right, Wolves get their swag back in LA, 127-117. They come back home with the one seed, four games to play. Tomorrow off, back at home Tuesday for the Wizards. Tip off for one, that one. One more thing. Yeah, go one ahead. more yeah. thing. Uh, I saw this insane stat on mm-hmm. Twitter uh, yeah. during the show what you got? that I wanted to spit back here. This Please. is from Jimmy Knutson on Twitter. With a 54th win tonight, Chris Finch has won more games this season than 10 Wolves coaches did in their entire tenure Stop as it. coach of the Timberwolves. Stop, dude. What? So hopefully that Finch stat makes up for me not being able to, to speak 
<laughs> stop can. it stop it uh as always man huge shout out to all you guys that stayed up late for this one uh, rest assured we'll be back each and every game same time same place right here to break it all down quick reminder go check out all of jack's work on x at gr borman 13 make sure you check out the entire basketball crew on the minnesota basketball party that's each and every wednesday sam ekstrom hostin um gophers legend ron johnson carol evans reggie wilson and don't forget ben beacon always ripping it up over on the Locked on Wolves podcast each and every day as well. All right, that'll do it for us tonight. He's Jack Borman. I'm Luke Inman on Twitter, at Luke underscore Spim. And until next time, signing out.